Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today I'll be talking about endgame tactics. Now personally I know that there are many people who struggle with endgames heavily because it seems to be a foreign concept. A lot of people think that with such few pieces on the board it is really hard to do anything and that neither side can gain advantage realistically. This is a very common thought especially for beginners because they just feel like with such few pieces it's almost impossible to win. So today I'll be sharing some very common examples about how you might be able to win depending on what type of situation it is. Now for some more advanced players most of these positions will be more familiar but I'll describe in depth as to why these positions were made in the first place. This first position is a very very well known position where both sides have three pawns and white's pawns are much more advanced up the board than blacks. In this position, uh, there is a very easy way for white to win this position. Now, first things first, you might note, white's king's in the corner. There is no way that he's going to be able to promote a pawn, right? Well, there is a way, and this is known as deflection in chess, which is when you force your opponent to make a decision which weakens one side, and it might strengthen another, and in this case it does, but usually it does not. So, you can take some time, if you don't know the answer, to think about this a little bit. And what do you think white should play? King b1, f6, g6, h6. There's only so many moves. Alright, so hopefully you've got a decent thought of it. Let's just go over them step by step. Obviously, king b1 does not make any sense. Because even if white did not know how to play it, black can just wait. And as long as black presses down on white's king, nothing can happen. Now, moving back, in this position, if white plays f6, now black can lock up the position with g6. Notice how black still has three pawns in the center, so nothing here has really changed. Moving on, h6 does not work for the exact same reasoning. g6 locks it in. So this means this brings us to our last option, g6. Now, why does g6 work? Well, first things first, black has two options. Black can either take back with the f-pawn. Now, notice how black's pawns are more conjugated to the right side. Like, most of them are on the right side. This leaves the left side more exposed. In this position, white plays h6. h6 is another deflection move. You want to deflect the pawn back here. Now, if g takes f5 is played, then h takes g7, and white promotes. If g5, h takes g7, then white promotes. So black has to take back, and after this, as you can see here, all of black's pawns have been deflected. So now white can play f6, and now white can safely promote. So this is one very big example of what is known as a pawn breakthrough. There are many other types of breakthroughs, which are much more famous than this, but this is arguably one of the more famous ones. And I believe that you can have a very solid experience learning about this. Because truthfully, from the very beginning position, this is a very simple position. There's nothing fancy, it's just three pawns against three pawns. And yet, one side is consistently able to win. Which is the side which has the pawns further advanced. Notice how, in the final position, it does have some pawn race ideas in it. If black pawns are more further advanced up the board, this wouldn't be a win for white. It would be a draw, or even worse, black would win. So it always depends on the position. But in this particular position, right here, white is winning. With a breakthrough deflection tactic. And notice how since there's only pawns on the board, you might be thinking, well, maybe pawn games are special because there's no other major pieces to defend. Uh, you would be partially right, which is why I want to move on to our next example. This is not exactly a tactic. This is more of a general rule of thumb. It's known as the knight square. Now, obviously no one's going to win this position because a knight is insufficient material and it's clear that the pawn on h6 is blocked. Or is it? Black has to be decently careful here to make sure that he doesn't lose. For example, after white plays king g6, well, the first move is easy. Knight of a has to be played, right? Because if a knight of f8 doesn't go to f8, then you're going to lose a knight, and the king is way too far away to get back. So, after this, white will play something like king g7. 
Now, black has a couple options, black win 97, black win 96, and the other two don't work. Well, 96 is a check, so realistically you think that it's correct, and yes it is. Now, white has an interesting choice. The first choice that white can do is, well, at the moment, white can probably see that black has a threat of playing move knight g5. Knight g5 will protect h7 again. So, white will try to protect against it, but if king g6, then obviously we're just repeating the position, so nothing fancy there. So what can black white do? Well, white can play king f6. This forces knight back to f8. And let's say white plays king f7. Well, now there's no check, but we know where the knight needs to go, right? So far, we've been staying on these three squares. Nothing special. But watch this. When the king attacks knight again, and the knight moves to g5, then white can play move king g6, and all of a sudden, it appears as though black is stuck. Because no matter what black plays, it's not going to be a check. And it appears as though white black's knight cannot protect h7. Where my knight's on g5, it's pretty far away from where black is supposed to try and defend. So you might be thinking, well, clearly I already told you that this is a draw, so there must be some way to get a draw. And yes, there is. The move is knight e6. Now you might be noticing this is basically identical to the position we were at before, but instead of it being, so this is on the third move where black, white's play king e6, you can see the yellow highlights, and this is when black's just playing knight e6. You can see that after black's turn move, this is still a draw, and the main reason is after the move h7, Black of move knight a fate check. Now this is well calculated because this is purely coincidental that the knight is able to defend against the pawn on h6. If the pawn's on h7, this strategy would not work. And notice how the knight has been on these four squares exclusively. Notice how they form a square. This is why this defense is known as a knight square. So these four squares, because they form a square when the knight moves around them. This is one of the most well-known drawing mechanisms for black. And this is highly important because what we do know is that there are many, many special pieces. So to anyone who's already known both of these things, why do you think people came up with this? It's because it's essentially simplifying something which could happen. For example, going on to the previous position where there's only six pawns on the board, both sides start off with 16. So the chances that one side has an advantage over the other in terms of pawns, or worse, like this, more advanced pawns, it becomes a very difficult problem to deal with because you know how your opponent might win. And likewise, if you have the advantage, you know how to win. Same with this one. It's just a knight and a pawn, but what if there's multiple knights and multiple pawns? We have a knight and pawn in the game. What's the difference there? Well, there could be many, many changes, right? We just don't know. Last but not least, this is a problem which maybe some advanced players don't know. So, right at the moment it's blocked to move. And this is supposed to be a position where white plays and wins. Now, there's usually considered to be two parts to this problem. The first part is knowing what white needs to do. First things first, black does not have a good way of preventing white's pawn from promoting. Except for one move, which is rookie 6 check. Right? Black needs to check white as much as possible. Now, if white plays king b7, black plays rook d7. That's a pin, and then the pawn is exchanged off, and then it's a draw. If the king ever moves to the a file, then uh, black's able to play move rook c6, and then take the pawn as well, because then the rook also guards c8. A quick rule of thumb in endgames, the rook is almost always best placed behind the pass pawn. No matter if it's your pass pawn or your opponent's pass pawn, it's always behind the pass pawn. Now, behind means opposite the direction it's moving in. So, king b7 does not work. King e7, king e6, king e5 don't work. King e6 is obviously illegal. So, we have two options, king b5 and king c5. King c5 does not work because then the king is on the same file as the pawn. So, black does something which is very well known, and that is a skewer. Black brings his rook all the way down and threatens to play rook c1 no matter what. If you queen... Black plays rook c1 and takes your queen. So instead of doing that, what black should do, 
uh, what, what white should do is instead of playing with king b5 because you don't want black to have that opportunity but black's like hey i know that this is going to happen but i can just play the exact same move it's not like there's a difference here right well no not yet but if white plays king b6 black's just going to repeat and otherwise we already know that all the other moves don't work we've already proved this so white continues now black plays work before White continues. Black plays rook d3. Notice how in these moves there is absolutely nothing that black can do. Black has to give checks. And this is very important in these positions because giving checks indicates that black doesn't have anything else to do. And this is what white needs to use to his advantage. King c2. Now, as you can see here, because rook d1 to c1 will be covered after king c2, white has the space to play the move king c2. So, this is how white wins, and this would be the end of the story, if not for a well-known mechanism which black uses, and this stumps up a lot of beginners, maybe even you. Black plays rook d4. Now, in this position, how does white win? Take some time and hopefully you can see what black has in store for white. Alright, took some time, hopefully you paused the video. Now, in this position, you might be noticing, well, why can't I just queen? It's not like there's a fork or anything, right? Well, it's not really a fork with fork c4 check. The important emphasis here is that after queen takes c4, black's king is stalemated. And because of this, it's a draw. And not a win for white. And otherwise, if you don't take the rook, well, then you lose your queen. So what's the secret sauce here? Well, white actually promotes to a rook. And this is influential and important. Why? Because this rook has multiple threats. Now, first things first, stalemate trick does not work. Rooks cannot move diagonally. That's pretty understood. However, this rook wants to move to a8 and give mate. And because of the king's position, and because white's king cannot get any checks, Black can only play one move. Rook a4. Now, before, white was trying to throw in mate this way. But watch what happens after white plays the move king b3. This move attacks the rook, and also now, instead of going this way to attack, the rook now files the other way, towards c1. This is very important, because what this means is that this is actually a double attack. A discovered attack, in fact. So, despite only having so few pieces on the board, you notice how white actually has a winning position here. So, when many people say that in endgames, tactics rarely happen, they usually mean it in the case that when players go into an endgame, they usually just simplify all the pieces and get into a position where there's only two kings. That will happen with two evenly strength match players. But from my personal experience, as a skilled player and someone who specialized in endgames, I can confirm that for endgames, tactics is probably the most important thing. So obviously this continues my endgame series, which I discontinued for some time, but hopefully this video gives you more insights as to why endgames are important to study, and hopefully why you might consider endgames to be your new friend, instead of something you never like to learn. So hopefully you enjoyed this video, uh, if you did, please consider liking and subscribing, and uh, thank you for all the support.